Hey everybody, we're here cancelling noise. It's the noise cancelling podcast with two girls and two boys. Who's on the podcast today? Let's start with Cherie. I am Cherie L. Smith, editor in chief of Laptop Mag. And I'm Samuel Roberts, uh, Senior Entertainment Editor of Tech Radar. Sorry, Gareth, I thought you were going to say, Samuel, now you introduce yourself. No, I just need to sit here as the first on the list. There you go. Uh, hi, I'm Olivia Tambini. I'm the Audio and Music Editor at Tech Radar. And becoming quite a regular feature on this podcast. Very lovely to have you again, Olivia. Um, and I'm Gareth Beavis, Global Editor-in-Chief of Tech Radar. And, I mean, as you've all heard, quite good at singing, clearly. So you're welcome, listeners. Samuel, lovely to have you on. How oh, are thank you? you for having me, Gareth. I'm very good, thank you. Yes, looking forward to the end of the year. Not to date this podcast too much. I mean, yeah, straight away we are we we date these heavily, like by the minute. Sometimes, often things come in and we just talk about like it's happening right now. We're recording. Get behind the curtain. Very different thing. Olivia, you're wearing some lovely headphones. I am. I'm wearing the Apple AirPods Max currently because uh, I'm testing them out at the moment. A bit of a spoiler for what's going to happen later. But before we get into the big stuff this week, uh, we have got, well, we've got two big questions this year. Um, and I like this. So the first one is, what's the best tech-based Christmas present you ever received? And secondly, what techie Christmas present do you want this year? The answer will be nothing because surely we should all have what we want. Cherie, start us off. Um, the best I ever got was, um, my first laptop. It was, it, it wasn't a great laptop, but, um, it was a Toshiba. So there's that. It, it, it lasts, it's not, but for, for, it lasted about, uh, five years. So I can't even complain about it. Um, what I want, the techie gift I want for Christmas, actually, you know what? It's that, um, IQ presser, smart pressure cooker. IQ Chef, I think I think it's called. Okay. Any reason? Any reason, or just you know, you just got a space in the kitchen. Um, I've got space for my kitchen. I want to experiment with pressure cooking, and it looks really, really dope. And it's actually sitting in my Amazon cart, waiting for me to pull the trigger right uh, now. Ah, <laughs> uh, I've got a buffet. I haven't done my Amazon presents. Oh no! I better do that right after this pod because I'm going to miss the delivery. You can do okay. it during the podcast, Gareth, and we'll talk you through it step by step. I was like, no, that won't make a good gift. That'll make a good gift. I think that'd be great, great list. But then we'll know what Gareth's getting us for Christmas, and that'll be awkward. Yeah, that's true. That is true, yeah, exactly, because it is all coal. Samuel, what about you? <laughs> so the best tech Xmas gift I ever received was a PS2 in uh, Christmas 2001. Uh, my parents got, got it for me with um, 007 Agent Under Fire, a bad PS2 game, um, mm. first-person shooter. And um, I later managed to trick my dad into buying me Grand Theft Auto 3 when I was 13. Um, he should be in jail by now, really. Um, the fact that he still loose is unbelievable. Is that um, related to the game, just to be clear? <laughs> uh, well, just buying the game when it was rated 18 in the UK, yeah. basically. Um, I wasn't checking he was like, on the run for something else. You were just no, like... <laughs> not, not as far as I know. Um, Want and... it! Sit <laughs> or relax! In terms of um, a techie Christmas present I want this year, I really want someone to buy me an N64. Um, I've decided that this year, instead of going to restaurants, I just buy old games for old games consoles. Makes sense. And that's to me. my yeah, that's my way of like emotionally dealing with uh, twenty twenty. So um, yeah, if someone could buy me an N64, that'd be fantastic. Okay, Olivia Tambini. Um, so my favourite tech Christmas present was um, a little TV, a really, really tiny one. I don't even House, remember what small. kind. Well, you know, like... <laughs> 14, 14, 14 inch? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't remember the model, but it meant um, I could watch TV in my bedroom for the first time. And I used to wake up on a Saturday morning and watch Friends. So that was great. Um, How old this, are you at this point? Uh, 10, I think. <laughs> There are some themes in Friends that 10-year-olds would be confused by, even, <laughs> yeah, even the pre-Watershed pre versions. I just thought Jerry was funny, I think, at the time. Um, anyway, what I would like this year, and I'm definitely not going to get, is um, Bang & Olufsen have uh, refurbished the Beogram 4000C turntable. Um, mm. And it was rele uh, released originally in the 1970s, and they've just done 95 copies for their 95th anniversary. And it's just the most beautiful turntable I've ever seen. Oh, I feel like I'm now judging you for not getting it in on a professional level and finding a way to experience this. 
I mean, even, even ninety five is hard to get a hold of. In fairness, I I mean, I having spoken with the company, even the CEO doesn't have one. That's how rare they are. Wow. So. I feel like I like the fact it sounds like he's phoned the CEO and you said, "Have you got one?" He's like, "Not even me, Liv. Not even me." <laughs> <laughs> I will get one eventually. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Liam Neeson style. Like, I will get you. <laughs> uh, Samuel's confused me a little bit because I was torn between the N sixty four that I got as a Christmas present one year, and but I think my actual answer will be the Nintendo Entertainment System I got when I was seven. Because whenever I think our best Christmas present ever, it was that one. Like, just. And it was funny is the N64, I was desperate for that when it came out. I was a bit old as a teenager, but I was desperate for it. My parents told me I wasn't going to get it, even even told me off for buying the N64 magazine because all my friends were buying because they were going to get off Christmas. I wasn't going to get one. And they, got, they got genuinely annoyed at me. They said, you shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't get your sister excited about something like this because it's not going to happen. And then got one for me. So I was like, that was a, I can't work out whether I'm impressed by the long game they're playing or whether they were just messing with me um both both mum and dad listen to this podcast now so probably get an email about that they don't email me they text me um but the, the nez i played it a couple of times in a in a shop i played duck hunt with a laser gun or a light gun and i really loved it but i didn't think i was going to get one for christmas i got it and it just changed my life you know a games console in your in your happiness in your happy home brilliant and you never stopped hunting ducks did you gareth that go- continues to this day i mean the metaphor of that, yeah, absolutely. I never want to like actually shoot a duck, but the the goals that that gave me drive me on in my career every day. What is a duck? Is it traffic? There we go. Um, what I want this year, I have no idea. Like, I can't even think of presents that I want just full stop. I find it, I I find it in a horrible way, really difficult when people ask me and I get annoyed at them for like, stop making, give me hassle of like having to think of things that I want, and then later on I'm like, oh, I wish I'd asked for that because I actually did want something, but I've got no idea like what I'd want because I said most of the stuff that we we want we get to play with and test out and that's that's kind of the the beauty of this role so uh I would just say boringly the Garmin 4 and a 945 because I think it's the best running watch out there but my god that is a dull answer even I'm sad about saying it so <laughs> yeah so I'm going to ignore that there probably is something good out there but I can't think what it is a short throw projector I don't know which one the best one is right now but I love those little things yeah the idea of not having to put it on behind a wall it just shoots up into the into the big wall in front of you that would be lovely that but i'm not going to give myself any points for that and i'm going to go for ah oh, i think it's going to have to be live with the yes. tv just but sam made a very good st- strong case for actually live i'm, I'm going to be a dick i'm taking it away from you i'm giving it to sam because both, both his answers are too good <laughs> this right, is right. an outrage wow. yeah. his, his two answers have... dovetail together so well actually it was a more comprehensive answer the tv was the strongest single but as a combo samuel takes it I included a mini narrative about my dad going on the run from the law as well, which I feel like brings it some real, you know, flavour. Yeah, but I watch TV in bed. What's more interesting than that? Yeah, but I feel like you do that now. Like, really. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still, you're still living your best life. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, well, we covered that. Well done, us. Uh, what's going on this week? We've already led with it, but Olivia, you are reviewing the AirPods Max. I mean, $550 for a pair of headphones. What? Yeah, they are really, really expensive. They um, are. Uh, I don't want to give away any spoilers for our full review, so I'm not going to say whether they're worth the money yet. Um, but I will say that they do sound really, really good, surprisingly good. Um, and the noise cancellation is also spot on. So, yeah, it's we'll see. So the noise cancellation is, is an interesting one because I think that's something that I've seen both you and other people talk about as being amazing i mean what for me noise cancelling is seems to be fairly binary so what makes it that much better for you in these situations i think it's just going off where i've been testing them so like i've tested them like in my kitchen with like the washing machine on full and um also commuting which is a bit more you know the kind of thing people do when they're wearing these headphones um and it's just the amount of environmental noise that they're able to block out is insane and you know if you've got your music playing you really don't hear anything at all um, they also come with a transparency mode, which means you can let some environmental noise pass through the headphones if you need to like be aware for I don't know like travel announcements or something, uh, which is really handy. Um, it's just an easy to use system. Like a lot of headphones come with lots of different noise cancellation settings, you know, on a scale from like one to ten. Um, whereas these are just kind of you know always on, and always working. 
Cool. Yeah, you've answered that very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I suppose the, in the price is, is obviously there. And also, I think this podcast will be going out at the same time as the reviews goes live, just to point out massively behind the curtain again, straight away, there it goes. Um, but do you feel like the, the physical controls on them, which basically a, a Apple Watch jammed into the side of them with the digital crown and the button, do you feel like that works or did you, do you hanker for a touch panel? No, I really, really like the controls on the AirPods Max, um, mainly because uh, I feel like uh, touch panels on headphones are a bit hit and miss at the moment. I don't think the technology has been perfected to the point where it's always going to work reliably. And I feel like Apple as a company, it's never really like an early adopter to things which haven't been proven to work. So it makes sense that they've used these dials. And also the fact that it has got a physical dial makes it feel like you can really precisely adjust the volume, which is nice if you're a bit of an audio geek. That is nice. Cherie, you we first bonded over a headphone lead that you lovingly gave me so I could listen to music on the on the flight back from the US to the UK. You obviously know headphones inside and out. Do you care about these anymore now you've seen stuff? I care because of the price. Like uh, Apple is making a very bold gambit, um, pricing them the way that they are. Uh, once we start talking about five hundred uh, headphones over five hundred, I think uh, that you are a reference or studio grade laptop. Um, I think that you're uh, open back. I think that you have the like the best drivers, either Planar. Or uh, Neo Dianium. Uh, I think of vacuum tubes and preamps and all of this fancy equipment. So to know that these are just for uh, a pair of noise canceling headphones, uh, albeit from Apple, I am very curious to see if they actually do live up to the price because at this point, at like, before any reviews come out, the gold standard for noise canceling as it pertains to on or over ears are, of course, Bose with the Sony, uh, the Sony W, uh, let's see, W. Come on, you can do this. The W, uh, H. I forgot, WH-1000XM4 yeah. being a, clo- a very close um, second. So those are the, like reigning kings of the act of noise canceling uh over an on-ear headphone universe so uh, to price your headphones at least three hundred dollars three to two hundred dollars more than both of those leading systems is very very bold and it makes me wonder who exactly these headphones are for and who are they for I'm not sure yet. Like I haven't got my hands on a pair yet. Like I that pricing price that that price tag just excludes a lot of people uh from the usual music lover gambit. I mean, I love a colorful pair of headphones and I like the colors that Apple are throwing down, but I don't I don't know how many I, and what maybe what do I know? Because right now, if you're trying to buy them, they're saying that you can't that the you have a three to four month wait. So maybe it is a, a headphone for everybody. And uh, Apple is raising the bar for headphone companies because before, if you said, "Oh, well, it's five hundred five hundred and fifty dollars," eh, no one's buying that. But because it's Apple, people are opening their wallets. So who knows? This might lead to a renaissance and um premium headphones let's test samuel would you buy these headphones do you own any apple headphones um only the ones that came with my uh ipod in about 2009 um i think they still make the journey with me whenever i move house i don't think i've spent more than 50 pounds on headphones i have spent more than 100 pounds on a headset um but i just i can't see myself ever investing in in that no um but um i know I, i'm aware that there you know there are entire groups of people who do want that premium quality and feel and some people who will buy everything that apple makes so um yeah it's uh it's it's tricky well would you maybe not buy a pair of headphones but would you subscribe to a service that helps you get fit with apple um i feel like all i would be doing is paying apple to guilt me for the lack of exercise that i do yes and that is a free service (laughs) that i provide myself um so uh yeah 
That is the most beautiful segue of all time because I've been testing out Apple Fitness Plus and my biggest worry is that I am just going to end up with shame for not using it all the time right now because um, for those that haven't heard about Apple Fitness Plus, it well, it's primarily designed for watch users. So people who've got an Apple Watch, they get a month free or three months free if they buy a watch now. And it's this... I don't know if if you've ever been on been to a gym that has classes that you sign up for, you book into or whatever, but it's spin classes or treadmill or hit or yoga or anything like that. It's basically that being brought to your TV, iPad, iPhone, and it interacts with the watch and it will show you metrics in the corner. So you've got your heart rate or calorie burn. It will show you how far ahead or behind you are of the average effort that people are putting in for that kind of thing, and and it has all these very Instagrammable trainers who have their own profiles and personalities and they're very joyous and energetic about everything and there's lots of music associated with every every workout. I'm saying these things in quite a condescending tone, but that's only because I'm British um, and energy and happiness don't go well with my sensibilities. But the um, but the idea of it is interesting because it's you know $79 a year. I think it's $9.99 a month. And I've been, I was trying it this morning for the first time. I watched a, I watched a workout last night because I didn't have time to do one slash the inclination. So I watched to see what it was like. And it's just without that kind of, um, you know, those apps that give you like a program to follow to make you feel better, to give you some sense of progression. It's just a case of like, like you could book in down a gym and you've got to bring it up yourself. I find that, I find that quite difficult. So I, I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm trying to make a better point about Apple Fitness Plus rather than just like it allows you to jump around a bit. But it does, and it's quite cool when it works. But ultimately, I don't know if I'll keep going with it because they're not telling me to do it enough, and I need someone to shout at me to be like, "Oi, do this workout! You need to do it, otherwise you're letting everyone down." And I need that shame in my life. Just the fact that you have to pay for it, like not enough to make you do it, because like I've recently signed up to uh, a fitness subscription service, um, and the reason I've done it instead of just looking at workout videos on YouTube is because I know I have to pay. And if I don't do the workout, I've paid for literally nothing. True. But I mean, this is the, especially with this one, you get a one-time payment for make it cheaper or you could do it monthly. But I mean, how many people out there have got gym subscriptions that, or memberships they don't actually use because they're like, oh, well, I'm kind of used to it coming out of my account and I will use it at some point, but you know, I haven't. And I, what's the reason to do it? That's why. What's the solution then, Gareth? How do they make this a more compelling proposition to you? Does somebody to call your house and say, go for a run, asshole? Well, I mean, talking about the gym membership, I ended up going for runs um, outside all the time because I got more into the, that kind of running and just using the gym for a shower. It was over the road from our offices, but then I found out about six months after doing that that our offices actually had showers. And so I'd wasted about £300 for wow. literally nothing. So well done me for that. Um, the solution, there's, there's there's a boring solution, which is like, it would be great if you could like sign up to one of the fitness instructors that you like. Because people do that in in in, uh, in real life, in gyms. They'll go for a trainer that they like the you know, they like their energy, they like the way they put the sessions together and they will just do whatever they do. So they could just do whenever that person brings in a new session each week, I'll put it in my calendar and I'll do it and I'll find some time for it. That would work. Or, and I keep saying this about Apple, I just just get on board with this fitness train. People want to be told what to do. They want personal trainers on their phone. They want that kind of autonomy that they that they, they necessarily don't have themselves to go like, this is how you get fit. Can you do this? And like, yeah, I can do that. Thanks. And you do it and you feel good. And then the next one comes up and you do that again. And it, it makes you feel happy. I don't get why Apple doesn't want to do that, but that would be the thing that makes me, makes me do it. But equally, I think the fitness plus is, is quite cool. But the first one this morning, the whole, that little burn bar that tells you to you know, how far ahead behind you are. The second I started to fall backwards, instantly 10% more effort straight away just like can i can i get it back up again yes i can and then then i felt good about myself so it definitely works there are some good things and i really like the fact that it syncs the watch data straight up to your tv screen because it feels like you're playing a game but just a really quite poor one that's what happens when analytics rewire your brain gareth what i can't help it you see, you see things working everything is analytics to you now including yourself i mean it was that way before google analytics worked though i love metrics i love a proof that something goes in and then comes out again the right way that's what you want to see in life nerd <laughs> <laughs> fine we're talking about nerd stuff disney's investor call i mean is there a better way to find out about the future of star wars samuel yeah, so um, Disney last week had uh, an investor day, uh, which also doubled as a kind of live stream. Um, it was like a kind of traditional investor call meets Comic Con. It's like, what if yeah. an accountant came onto the stage in like Hall H and was like, you know, Thor? And it was um, it was quite a confusing mix tone wise, um, but it was quite exciting. They did um, they did announce uh, a whole host of stuff. Um, 
coming to Disney Plus, including uh, 15 Disney um, animation, Disney live action, and Pixar movies um, uh, are coming in the next few years, and 80% of them will come first to Disney Plus. So uh, on that front, it represents a huge um, transition from their existing kind of theatrical model, release a film in the cinema, and then comes out um they're experimenting with a bunch of different stuff uh so there's also going to be like mulan early this year uh, you'll be able to pay um x amount of money extra on top of your subscription to access a film that's releasing in theaters day and date on disney plus um and i think they're really just throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and seeing what works and uh there's a massive investment in marvel and star wars too there's going to be um 10 uh, Star Wars TV series and 10 Marvel TV series over the coming years. Uh, most of them we know about now after the presentation. And uh, yeah, basically, if Disney Plus has felt a bit light to you in this first year, and I think it definitely has, um, as good as The Mandalorian is, uh, it was doing a lot of heavy lifting by itself. Uh, this really felt like um, the next phase of um, of what they're going to try and do to um, to keep customers excited about the service. I mean, do you think do you think the name is weird? Like, why call it the Investor Call? Like you said, it, it is it, the Comic Con bit is the bit that sells it when you have those those uh, those events. So why not make it so that it sounds a bit cooler, like the Star Wars reveal? I don't know, like something that gets people a bit more jazzed about it. It felt like by calling it an Investor Day that it was almost trying to like put it under the radar. Yeah, it's complicated. I think it sort of speaks to the lack of um, live events going on this year. You know, like a kind of San Diego Comic Con where you could have this stuff out front and center or. Uh, Star Wars Celebration, where they would um, normally talk about these announcements. And so instead, they kind of rolled it all into this. Um, and it was kind of entertaining in places. They had a few trailers and stuff, but it was also very dry in places and ran for four hours. So it was quite a strange old mix of stuff. Um, but yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't a good time for you either, in terms of, physically, in terms of the, the hour of the day. Oh, well, yeah, it was obviously it was on US hours, so I stayed up late to watch it. Um, but it was it was fine. Uh, there's some other interesting stuff in there too. Like um, there's an Alien TV series in the works from uh, Noah Hawley, the uh, creator of uh, the Fargo TV series. So that'll be pretty cool, I think. And uh, the Star Wars TV shows I thought did sound really good. And um, even though they're kind of doubling down on IP, quote unquote, it, I, I would say that most people were quite excited by the uh, the range of announcements coming out of there. So I think it was a mission accomplished um, by Disney. But there's um, a bunch of other kind of different stuff going on that they kind of slid out quite subtly, like uh, Disney Plus is getting a price bump in the US, I think in March next year, uh, of a dollar extra a month. And um, in territories uh, like some countries in Europe and other places will be getting a new channel within Disney Plus called Star, and that will increase the price of the service, but you'll actually get to watch adult content on Disney Plus. And I think this is how they're compensating for not having Hulu outside the US. Hulu is obviously like a general entertainment offering, um, and we don't have that in the UK from Disney. So their version of it is rolling it into uh, Disney Plus. Everyone pays extra for it, but you get a more well-rounded service. So, yeah, quite a quite a radical rethink of um, you know just releasing uh, kiddie cartoons and High School Musical um, every every week. So actually, I think Disney Plus is not kiddie friendly enough at the moment. Like, I've got a six year old in my life, and I'm constantly trying to work out what kind of things are age appropriate for her. Like um, Home Alone, turns out not good for a six year old at all. I thought, you know, this is going to be a great Christmas film. And like, just, you know, the bit at the beginning of Home Alone where they, uh, they're they getting onto the taxis and she turned to us and goes, they don't leave them at home, do they? And we were like, nope, turned it off <laughs> straight away. <laughs> like, and you realise like, I was like, they haven't, even got, they haven't even got to the point where they're going to, where the robbers are going to come and try and break in. And you're like, oh, okay, I, I this think is not... I, I think that goes back to the era that you're raised in, like '80s babies. Like no I one know. cared about no one cared about our well being. Like uh, I, you, you had movies like The Black Cauldron. ET was kind of terrifying. No one, no one cared about our well being or our mental health. I remember watching the Toxic Avenger. Avenger oh, all of that them. still messes me up now. He fell into fell into toxic waste. It's like Robocop, but for kids, it's awful. I a, a, I'm a huge fan of Toxic Avenger because it is made in Jersey, so Jersey strong. And B, it just, it, like, that thing was, like, watching it now, I'm like, oh my god, no one stopped me from watching this. Like, my, like folks were just like, eh, you're good. You'll, you'll, you'll survive this mental scarring. Uh, I, I've watched a few Cronenberg movies when I was, uh, <laughs> when I was way, way too young to watch them. And, you know, like the, the level of 
like, hey, kids bounce that that <laughs> prior generations had and, and like is just astounding nowadays. Like nowadays, I would never think I'm like, oh, maybe maybe I don't want my niece watching this. But bef- for me, it was like, yeah, nah, this is fine. It's cool. I have to know which Cronenberg films you watched as a kid. Like, don't say Crash. No, um, Jesus Christ. Um, Videodrome, of course. Like, just, just, like, didn't really understand what was going on. Just, just weirded the the heck out. Things like Killer Clown from Outer Space. Well, that's not a Cronenberg, but just, like, all those just really wild body horror movies, existence, and... <laughs> but those, those weren't bad, just children's films, though. That, like, and the like the reanimator films like I, just just nothing nothing a, a child my age had any business watching uh 8976 evil <laughs> just like or even or even there's this uh late 80s early 90s batman a uh, batman animated series that episode where clayface becomes clayface and they uh feed him that chemical and he's like N-, and you just see a silhouette of him just kind of choking to death like not like this not nah. like s- scarred for life scarred for life we have got niche Cherie. i feel like we really like uncovered a <laughs> uncovered a seam in your psyche that needed to be released for a while so we need to add the fly to disney plus that's what you're saying right i am i am you know what i am very curious to see what disney is going to do with aliens but it's an adult thing. That's the point. So it's uh, it's a different it's a different genre completely, right? You can do what you want with it. Can you like Disney? Disney only lets you go so far. Like, so I think I see. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that they're going with such a hard R of a franchise. So I'm I'm, I'm very curious to see if they're going to let it stay a hard R, or if they're just going to there's going to be a lot of off scene kill shots and maybe a lot of gross out shots instead of well no the the xenomorph is punching a hole through that person's body with his secondary mouth or oh no someone's leg is getting melted off with acid we shall see I guess Liv what scar what, what scarred you the most as a child <laughs> just in general <laughs> everything. <laughs> Um, no, I think um, a lot of the Roald Dahl adaptations, so like the original... Willy Wonka and Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka, there's that, that is horrible up. scene with the when they're on the boat, boat. and there's all the hallucination. And, that, and that, the man's getting his teeth chopped out with a hammer or something like that. Like, yeah. It, what it, is that? It is horrible. Then there's things like Matilda and you've got Miss Trunchbull and she locks them in the spiky cage the and choking. the witches with, you know... Um, they pull off their faces. Oh and my god, got... that that was the best scene. <laughs> I, was, I just... guess I was desensitized by them. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think those are scary. But I mean, the books themselves were kind of scary, and I loved them as a kid. But I think, like, probably what's more damaging was like, um, and I love, I love Disney. I love Disney films. Uh, I watch them all the time. But like, um, the way like Disney princesses were portrayed. Like, I was watching The Little Mermaid recently. And I didn't realize until now how problematic it is that, you know, she uh, gives up everything to be with this man, changes everything about herself and doesn't talk and it's all fine. Well, I mean, as you get older, watching some of those films is just interesting. As a kid, I, oh my God, I rented Little Mermaid every weekend for like 10 weeks. And now watching it, I'm like, wait a minute. A, your father's right. You're way too young to talk about you're in love with someone <laughs> 16-year-old mer, mer young lady. Number two, oh, so you just gonna sell out the whole kingdom just for this dude you saw once and you gave him some mouth-to-mouth, so I guess you're qualifying that as your first kiss? Girl, you, you just you just for the streets. Out here for the streets. And also, like at the end, King Titan goes, Yeah, 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 you can go and do that. I feel like I'm now judging him for like just how much I'm going to miss her. No, yeah! just how much he's going to hate me for not saying no to this again because it's the right thing to do. It's also, like, it's really bad parenting. It is it bad is, parenting. It, but like Ariel continues that bad parenting because in the subsequent movie where she has her old daughter, she doesn't tell her anything about, hey, 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 I'm a mermaid. She just keeps her daughter away from the water. Like, do not go near the water. Like, it, it, it's a whole thing. It's like, oh man, this is bad parenting. This is 
this is not good. So would you count bad parenting as letting your child play cyberpunk, for instance, Samuel? Uh, yes, that would be bad parenting. And that includes kids who are like 25 or older. I still think that would be um, <laughs> bad parenting. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, is that your uh, transition, Gareth, to a different subject? Not to don't, kind of go too granular about the, um, don't the show bonus people, of this. Don't show people about the clever pathways that I'm crossing. Yeah, so uh, Cyberpunk 2077 has launched after being in development for around eight years, I think, um, on and off. I think it's only really been a full development since The Witcher 3 DLC ended a few years ago. Um, but it's launched on PS4, Xbox One, and uh, PC, and Google Stadia. I almost forgot that last one. I wonder why. And uh, yeah, so it's a bit of a buggy game at launch. I've played about four hours of it, but we've got a review on uh, Tech Radar that people can read. And uh, it's definitely feels a bit unfinished on pc where i'm playing it with um like a pretty good graphics card pretty good pc it's uh it's quite quite rough in terms of performance uh but on consoles it's apparently even worse and so i've been watching a few videos of this and the frame rate's really bad and the game looks kind of murky and it just doesn't look like a finished console version this has led to a quite a big backlash where uh the developer cd project red has vowed to fix the current gen versions of the game um reportedly the game works a bit better on uh, next gen consoles when using backwards compatibility but the issue is that obviously this game was always meant to release earlier this year so there wouldn't have even been next generation consoles around when the game was supposed to come out uh, so I don't know what their plan was, just to hope that it went out into the world and that no one kind of got angry about it. But <laughs> it seems like a bit of a misfire. They kind of say that they didn't give the console versions enough attention in the run-up because they were focused on next-gen and PC. But whatever way they try and explain it, it doesn't look good. And now they're kind of offering refunds for people who have bought it either digitally or physically. They, <sighs> my God, they needed to push this back an a, another year. Yes, we would have been upset, but not as upset as this. This is just a just just layer upon layer of just ineptitude and disappointment and, and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, a real mess for sure. It's um also quite interesting because I feel like CD Projekt Red's always had a lot of credibility among the quote unquote gamer sort of crowd. Um, you know, for better or worse, and that seems to have evaporated straight away now because people have really turned on the game and uh, and them um and they're kind of trying to salvage their reputation a little bit now and uh i do think there is some real magic to that game underneath it all but it's a very adolescent game at the same time it's very gratuitous in a way that doesn't come across as like mature it just comes across as well here's someone naked and uh isn't aren't you so impressed by this and uh all the violence is um is really over the top and i think tone wise it just struggles a little bit because in places it's quite heartfelt and the storytelling is really good uh it's just a weird old mix of tones a very strange game indeed why is cyberpunk so so vaunted as a, as a title you know I've, I've seen it being talked about for so long i've never played it myself and i always feel like it has this kind of almost i don't know I don't think the word, what the word could be, but it's sort of deified as this game that people are so excited about it, it sits in that top pantheon and what is it about it that makes it so like desirable for everybody that makes them feel like if it's rubbish then their lives are over i feel like it's uh, so it's based on a tabletop rpg but i don't think that's really part of it it's because um the witcher 3 was such a beloved um open world rpg it was largely considered the best of its type of this last generation so the idea of the same developers applying their expertise to this vast sci-fi setting was really exciting and the uh, the witcher 3 was noted for having really good quest design as well really good writing and uh cool characters but um yeah uh, so that just led to anticipation kind of going through the roof but also i think cd project red's been promoting it for too long and too hard so in retrospect i don't know if it was a good idea to have like keanu reeves come out on stage at e3 2019 like at what point are you just setting the hype levels too high for you to actually um to actually meet people's expectations then again if the game was good we probably wouldn't even be asking that so it's tricky you know i mean keanu reeves if you get the opportunity just take him you know you don't say no to keanu no. Are you suggesting we try and get him on this podcast, Gareth? I mean, I think it's inevitable now, really. <laughs> sure. I've got I've got many questions about many of his works. Uh not least the Matrix, obviously. But I've got oh the Man of Tai Chi, that was what it was. I want I've got questions about that film, which is excellent. And the final fight scene is still one of the most saddening moments of my life, not because of the content, but just because of the way it was handled. I love that that was your go to second Keanu Reeves movie. Not speed or like 
I have know, no questions about break. these. They're perfectly, perfectly happy with those. Actually, they're because I, I, I hate romantic movies and I hate rom coms, but there's one that I used to love when Bill I was a kid. It was, it was a walk in the clouds, like that Keanu Reeves movie, just random Keanu Reeves romance movie. Like I just, for some reason, I was just about this movie all the way. I can't say I've seen it. I remember, is The Lake House another Keanu Reeves rom-com? Yes. Um, Sandra well, Bullock. I don't think that's a rom-com. I think that's a rom drum. <laughs> or just rom. It's yeah. rom. It's got time travel in it, so that's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Wait. yeah, no, I didn't watch that because I typically don't I haven't, do I haven't seen it either. But Walk in the Clouds, uh, it was like right after World War II, uh, Keanu's playing uh, an American soldier, and this... this um, beautiful mysterious italian woman is hey could you come home with me and pretend to be my fiance i forgot why but like yeah she because keanu he, uh, apparently and he goes back and of course the family owns this beautiful villa on this italian vineyard and he like they slowly fall in love do while doing this ruse and he learned like he learns about life love and wine and it, it was it was it was cheesy super cheesy that reminds me a lot of Holiday in Handcuffs with uh, Melissa Joan Hart and Mario Lopez, where she literally kidnaps a man because her parents want her to have a boyfriend for the holidays. And they live so far away from civilization that he can't really get away because he's handcuffed. It's a funny film. I didn't even know it was possible to watch a, a theatrically released movie that starred Melissa Joan Hart. This is news to me. Yeah, I know, what? right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was, we mostly watched it because of the whole how come Mario Lopez doesn't age question and then just accidentally got drawn into it because it was just such a bad premise basically like she's literally kidnapped a man and i mean spoiler they fall in love i don't know how because that's just i don't know stockholm syndrome i think i mean that's the same premise of overboard yes ah, oh, good film mm, oh. i don't know watching it now like that like y y yeah as i've said i'm not sure I, I think i should say that anymore i just when i was younger i really liked the goldie horn films i don't know why yeah like private, it's private like, benjamin brilliant too house sitter you're having you're having intimate contact with someone who doesn't really know who they are mm, mm, uh, yeah as you say mm, that not so good I don't know. <laughs> but she is good in the christmas chronicles too which i have just watched so there's one for you uh live if you could put keanu reeves in any film that he's not in which one would you choose <laughs> <laughs> Really weird question. Um, but you'll answer it okay. straight away. You watch. All right. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, the live action. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? Bell. <laughs> I actually don't know because actually it's a perfect film. I probably wouldn't recast anyone, but like maybe there could be like a new, like perfect. talking sidekick or something, like an animal or something. First of all, he'd be a great candlestick. And secondly, it's the perfect film. <laughs> <laughs> it is the perfect film. I wa I literally watch it like probably four or five times a year. I sing the songs all the time, especially the Gaston song. Um, I love it. Uh, there's so much to unpack with that, but I haven't got time, unfortunately. <laughs> um, why the Gaston song? Just I have to ask. It's just a great song. Do you okay. not know it? I, I do know it. There is no one quite like Gaston. Exactly. It's yeah. a great song. Cool. <laughs> right. Before we run out of time completely, we need to move on to the news blast. And Cherie... You're up for it this week, right? Yep, apparently. <laughs> I mean, last week, Liv absolutely nailed it. She was, yeah, that's not happening. She was in the zone <laughs> with, with 12. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, right, so you know the rules. You've got 60 seconds to give the readers, the readers, the listeners, sorry. You've got 60 seconds to give the listeners the flavour of as many news stories as possible. The only rules being you must not read out from a script and you must make sure that each story has at least some level of explanation so people can understand what they've just heard you can't just do the headlines so you've got 60 seconds on the clock are you ready sheree let's do it three two one let's go hey remember when ea play was supposed to come out for uh xbox game Pass? yeah that's not happening until next year so keep waiting uh samsung is just giving us lots of foldables how many foldables four so you're going to get the g the galaxy z fold and three other phones stay tuned for that 2021 uh Okay, if you need this, you can now play your Spotify podcast through Amazon Echo Speakers. Have at it, folks. Uh, Joanna Dark 
15 years later is making a return uh, via the Game Awards uh, trailer. Super excited for that. Uh, Samsung better have confirmed uh, pen support for the S21 since they killed my beloved Galaxy Note. I am upset with you, Samsung. Uh, Among Us, you want to be sus? You want to be sus on your Nintendo Switch? Now's the time. It's available. Go get it. Uh, Apple Watch 7. I don't do Apple Watches, but apparently Touch ID is coming, and that's going to be a good thing Stop. for your fans. Stop. You did seven. That's not bad for me. No, that is your second best after the eight you got last time, but better than the four you got the first time. So Indeed. I see there's a general upward curve on the line that they do, the correlation line where it's called on graphs. Fun fact as well, that Joanna d'Arc is named after the French for uh, Joan of Arc, Jean d'Arc. Today I learned. I was I was well into Perfect Dark on a pre-release to the point where I actually wrote about it in somebody's leaving book at school how excited I was and that exists somewhere now. <laughs> that thing I wrote down like it's been pre-release in three days. I can't wait. So uh, <laughs> and it was quite underwhelming as a game, if I'm honest. I played it the other day. Wasn't that excited. Golden Eyes way better. Right, let's move on to the next section. Cherie, can you sing us in? Unpopular opinions. Let your hate them furl. Laptops, tablets, entertainment, we're going to burn it all. Unpopular opinions. Samuel, sing it. Unpopular opinions. <laughs> <laughs> you really caught me off guard there. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is to keep off guard. Sometimes people do it, very rarely. You just did it. I'm so happy. Yeah, I can't sing. Yeah, um, I, 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 I feel satisfied. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, wow, there you go. Now that I'll never recover from that, shall we move on to what the unpopular opinion actually is, Gareth? Yes, I mean, you, you could have segued yourself, but I like the fact that we're signposting this. Well, a bit of a back and forth, you know, just keep the uh, <laughs> keep the listener interested. Um, yeah. So, Absolute yes. banter, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, my unpopular opinion is uh, you can never have enough Star Wars. And I say this because uh, this... So the Disney investicle, they announced a whole bunch of stuff. They reveal more information about the obi-wan kenobi tv series which will feature hayden christensen reprising his role as uh darth vader which for some reason some people are excited about i don't know why even though those prequels are terrible um darth, darth vader yeah i mean anakin skywalker i, I don't know uh, i mean they, like when, when he's just like you know what these younglings is go are going to get it i, <laughs> I, I listen that that spoke to that spoke volumes to me but again, maybe that's that eighties baby desensitization. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I wait. I feel like yeah, yeah. Uh, the younglings had to go because they were so irritating in that film. So I kind of see what he was going for. But yeah, um, I I can't say I'm that excited about seeing Hayden Christensen in Star Wars again. Um, but some people seem to be. So yeah, um, there was that, and there was a Cassian Andor TV show, which is uh, connected to the Rogue One TV series. That's going to be 12 episodes long, and they showed off some um, uh, images of that. Apparently it has more than 200 named characters, so it's quite a big deal. Um, they're filming that uh, now, I believe. And uh, there's more. There's a, a series called uh, The Acolyte, I think. It's uh, kind of a, a rumor to be a martial arts-style series, but it's set in a different era of the Star Wars universe. There's a kind of anime anthology show. There's also going to be another animated series called The Bad Batch. There's going to be... Uh, two Mandalorian spin-offs, one called Ahsoka and the other called Rangers of the New Republic. Um, Ahsoka Tano was a very popular uh, addition to The Mandalorian Season 2, played by Rosario Dawson, so a lot of people are excited to see uh, where that goes next, including me. Um, and then I saw some people on social media had the audacity to suggest that there's too much Star Wars in the works, and I'm not having it, frankly. Um, and that's my unpopular opinion, Gareth. I mean, there is too much Star Wars for two reasons. How dare you? One, I don't care about Star Wars. Never have. Just watched it, wasn't bothered. Carry on with that. I appreciate other people do. And for those other people, I feel like this is ruining it. You, like, you need that kind of sanctity of like the big release. It's like it's like football, which we'll all understand. The idea <laughs> that uh, if you you know if you put football on all the time, those big games just take less meaning. You know, there's too much. Football. But there's 38 games a year in football. That's that is all the time. Well, that's that's 38 games plus the League Cup, plus the Champions League, plus the qualifiers, plus the Nations League, plus the internationals. Plus, and there's like, well, now there's football all the time. It loses its kind of like, oh, I can't wait for the big game because they're literally all the time. And it's the same with Star Wars. You know, we don't need all this backstory and stuff. Or they need to at least stretch it out over a longer period of time so you don't feel like you're inundated and lose interest. How dare you, sir? Frankly, I mean, 
I appreciate like I appreciate that we are moving away from the Skywalker saga. Like for the most part, like it, it, I, I, I think now that we've done, we've done whatever, what Disney's done, whatever they've just ran it into the ground. I think we need to take a break from that, uh, like 10, 15 years. <laughs> but I, I am all for getting stories, like especially Ahsoka. I, oh my God. I, I, she has been my favorite character since Clone Wars and I was dying for some live action. They gave me just what I wanted. And if they could keep that going, I am going to be there for that and even more. Um, I want to see different parts of the world because it, it's such a vibrant diverse world and for so long we've just been glued to these particular characters it's just i think it's going to be fun to be able to meet new heroes and heroines and uh baddies and things of that nature because personally i would like to have a general grievous origin st uh story thing going on I, like i like he was one of my favorite villains in the clone wars and i just want to know how he got that way but this is this is clearly just. I mean, forgive me if I'm just making a sweeping generalization about something I don't know about. But surely this is just Disney trying to monetize a franchise and, like I said, doubling down on the IP, as Samuel said in inverted commas, to the point where it just becomes another Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, and that that's kind of the all the time forever. That's not what Star Wars should be. I don't think they're going to be explicitly connected in the same way that no, the no, MCU but, is. So. Not explicitly connected, but they are still part of the same world, so that you can keep every time something happens, it's to do with that same origin in your own mind of like why you love it you'll instantly absorb it because it's star wars yeah i feel like most of it will be able to be in uh, enjoyed individually though with the possible exception of the um mandalorian spin-offs which seem to tie directly into um obviously the main show um i don't know i don't think that you have to watch all of it is the thing like it, there's it, there is a lot of it i agree it's a a lot for any series and clearly they've looked at the success of the mandalorian and gone well that's what people want right now more than the rise of skywalker which surely most people can agree was a terrible film um but uh maybe not read it i don't know but uh yeah that's uh that's my take gareth star wars is uh is good um but you don't have to watch all of it Liv, final thoughts on this is it good or bad opinion uh i don't know i kind of agree but you can have too much of a good thing like this year there was like three series of RuPaul's Drag Race back to back and like obviously I was going to watch them but it did feel like a bit of a slog and also I feel like you can kind of like ruin things by um like doing like non-canon things so like for example I love Harry Potter a lot and like sometimes I'm surprised to find out things you know like that JK Rowling's written on like the Pottermore website which is now part of the story but never was before and it's kind of Sometimes you just want to imagine, like, maybe this happened before, you know, the, the movie that I've seen, or maybe this happens after the characters, and you don't always need everything to be wrapped up. If it's not canon, then does it count? And therefore, people will feel annoyed at having watched it and tried to invest in the thing that they love. I don't know. I don't oh. know. I think Star Wars and RuPaul's Drag Race are basically the same thing, so it's a it's an apt <laughs> comparison. Um, you know, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was giving Samuel the space to, to jump in with the same point. I mean, they're both basically the same as the MCU. So ultimately, I, your point absolutely stands. Right, we are nearly at the end of this podcast. Oh, it is whooped along again. Every time I am told by a producer that we need to keep it under 50 minutes and I am just about to ruin that. Uh, two things there. I made that up. He's never told me we have to keep it down below and this will probably get edited out. Boom, shank. Uh, right, Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> I just realised it was nonsense. So have fun with that, Matt. Um, Samuel, have you had a good time today on this podcast? Wow, is that what you do at the end of the podcast? You ask, did you enjoy the thing that just happened i mean the answer is yes gareth yes i had a great time well i'm now going to follow up questions like how would you have ended the podcast then if you're such a good podcaster which you are back page pod uh, i would have considered uh, continued the thread you went down there about the producer and said actually my producer's never said that in fact he's been dead for five years and uh and really kind of gone dark with it um uh, yeah that that, that... <laughs> oh, but now, we have, now we have to keep that bit in and it's so look real. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say the bit again. Um, why don't you just ask me, have you had a good time? And I'll say, yes, I have, Gareth. No, we're keeping the whole thing in. Liv, have you had a good time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, thank you, thank you, perfect guest. You're wonderful. Cherie. <laughs> you know I did. You know I listen, I live for these times when we get to I get to talk to you and like my tech radar people and sometimes my laptop people and my TG folks. 
Uh, out of 10, what would you give the podcast? I'm going to really double down on really and analyzing what we've done. I mean, I'm always going to say it's a 10 out of 10. True. Thank you very much. And I appreciate that. Uh, if people want to get in contact with you, Cherie, I felt they could do that somehow. Yes, they can do that on uh, Twitter or Instagram at Miss Smith 11. That is M I S S Smith 11. And of course, re laptop mag. We've got a whole bunch of end of year content just waiting, waiting to be read and loved and adored. And maybe you'll buy some things. Maybe you'll laugh. Maybe you'll cry. But either way, laptop then, laptop now, and laptop forever. Samuel, follow that. How can people get in contact with you? Um, they can uh, tweet me at Samuel W. Roberts, although I don't recommend following me on Twitter. It's just not worth it. Disagree. Samuel is a rollickingly good listen. Listen, read, Twitter, <laughs> follow, whatever, yeah. Um, Olivia, I forgot your name. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. No, no, I didn't forget it. My brain was like, say Liv. I was, the part of my brain was like, no, that's not that's not professional enough. Say Olivia. I was like, why would I be professional? And then we got to where we got to. You literally you never call me Olivia anyway, so that's because in, you care? in the corner of your your uh, call on the meet that we've got going on so we can all see each other, it says Olivia and it messed with my brain. <laughs> Sure you can did. find me uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Olivia Tambini. And would they find excellent content on Instagram, such as great musical capabilities and lovely ink art? <laughs> For God's sake. <laughs> yes. Oh, look but... at her blushing! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do some stuff on there for fun. Um, I'm not professional, so don't get excited. Cool. I'm being Gareth Beavis. You can follow me on Twitter as Superbeave. Uh, we've got Tech Radar on all the socials under helpfully just Tech Radar, although Twitch we messed up and I can't even remember what our channel is for that. I don't think we've used it, so that's fine. Um, please do follow us. We are also planning loads of good content, but we're focusing hard on that bit between Christmas and New Year, where we're going to put all of our lovely content for you to read. Great features, great things to wrap up the year, great looks forward to the next year coming. Uh, so once you've had all of your turkey and you are very tired and just want to mess about on your phone, just browse Tech Radar. You'll have a great time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. It's lovely to have you here, Samuel. Thank you for having me, Gareth. It's been a, it's been a delight. Yep, out of 10, how was it? Uh, it was a 9, but then you made me sing, so I went down to a 7. Um, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> what's brilliant is Liv's walked out away from her microphone but she's got her headphones on so that you can hear everything <laughs> we are absolutely keeping this there's no doubt this is staying in even though Liv thinks she's got away with sorry. it sorry it's alright we keep, we're keeping all the because we can hear you perfectly fine <laughs> oh no I must turn off the microphone <laughs> it went wrong <laughs> all the best well. podcasts end that way it's fine exactly so Liv just sign us off with one more line go uh, get jiggy with it Bye everyone, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>